Kisha mikono yangu juu Naisifu nchi yangu marufu Nanyosha mikono yangu juu Naisifu nchi yangu marufu As I mentioned since yesterday, two main uh, uh, kind of operatives this year. <coughs> One is smart networks, systems, otherwise known as complexity, chaos and all that. And the other one is learning. You can't talk about one without the other. We all do that. The nature of the CPTM and smart punishes the raison better is to learn from each other in a real-time situation. So we might want to reflect a bit more when and how one can learn. And of course, the smart <coughs> partnership, it means that nobody knows more than the others, and this is what we all know about it. So everybody can <coughs> contribute to this kind of win-win at any point of time. Last year, we had, I had with me two or three of our colleagues who introduced each session and this time, Sam Tulia Mujica, that's one of the reasons why I'm a, we are a bit late, is still kind of coming from the airport. Sam was supposed to join me. Um, and I will try probably not to do a sum, because I can't do that. Each of us are so unique. I will try simply to say that um, last year we kind of looked into thinking fast and thinking slow. That's in addition to the topics that we've been dealing with. We start at the beginning each session with trying to see what does that mean. Not because we try to get a Nobel Prize beyond uh, Kahneman, <coughs> but because it makes sense. And um, this year, because we are at the end of the year, as far as I'm concerned, and when Sam comes, he will bring you his uh, uh, Bakiga, <coughs> Bakiga says. I, I will go around the issues of how to eat and think. And it's not my, but it is my inspiration since last year on how to defeat anybody who tries to follow the recipes. And I got um, this called the virtue of the table, which uh, I will from time to time come up with to remind us that um, recipes, uh, the big Caribbean or otherwise. You have a seat here, Ivan? Yeah. What about this? Okay. Fine. Um, now, I, I, I'll probably contradict, and that a little bit, or stimulate, Yanir, who is the person we refer to when we say system, scales and complexity for the next one day and a half. Yeah, near high. And um, to say that, um, and I'll probably contradict for sure our Chief Cabinet Secretary of the PS from Namibia, I'm, I'm saying that uh, virtues are more important than the rules. Rules are very rigid, as we know, and when we try to follow rules, recipes, I'm sure that we forget about the fact that the ingredients that are brought in from various parts, the mixed up ingredients, Yanir were telling us yesterday something which I, don't, I didn't understand, but I looked him up last night on renormalization or something, he will tell us about it, that if you add one plus one plus one, ingredients which are not connected to one another <coughs> don't necessarily make a good soup or stew. But if one ingredient you know that mixed up with another ingredient and mixed up with other ingredients and put at the right time, they make something else which is called soup, not any of those ingredients. Is that what it means to realize all <laughs> one? So I'm saying, I don't know who. 
any of us who, not just the ladies, who can cook following the recipe. I don't think you either following the rules, and then you have you follow the rules, never mind the outcome, or you taste as you go along and you try to make sure that you put a bit more salt, you put a bit more this, a both bit both, more that. Both are very good ideas. So <laughs> that's the reason, Yaniel, why I chose to tantalize each time we do uh, go into a bit too deep discussion into the virtue of the table. And with that, I will probably uh, kind of uh, introduce Yaniel, in I, I fact, introduce system. We, we don't now, have a this, this time, because it's not a think tanking as such, <coughs> although we don't have a recipe that this is think tanking or it's not a dialogue, but we do dialogue with small d. <coughs> um, it is actually an exposure to a few more insightful uh, kind of uh, issues. Participate in the meetings. Um, <coughs> so let me just say a few words about what complex system science is, really. Uh, and I want to introduce it properly, and hopefully the AV equipment will be working in order to enable us to do that, but that may take a little bit. Um, complex system science is really about the things that you understand well, which is that the world has dependencies in it. Things depend on each other. The traditional science that you're taught in school is based upon mathematical methods that don't enable us to deal with dependencies. They are based on statistics and calculus. And statistics and calculus have approximations in them. And because of those approximations, the scientific fields have become limited in what they can talk about. And in recent years, we've learned how to go beyond those approximations and to incorporate an understanding of networks of dependencies and patterns of behavior that exist in the world. <coughs> it's really changed qualitatively, dramatically, what kinds of questions we can ask um, and, and what kinds of problems we can address. And I've been working in this area for uh, too long, uh, over 25 years. Um, uh, I wrote the first textbook in this field. Um, and. Um, a lot of the work that we've done over the years uh, uh, since then um, has been on problems that people have come to us with. Say, you understand complex systems, help us with this problem. And uh, it's been very gratifying that the methods that we've developed have been widely applicable to a lot of the problems that we're facing in the world. Um, uh, so uh, among the uh, problems that we've talked about are the global financial crisis, the global food crisis, the Ebola epidemic recently, we've worked on it, but we actually anticipated it starting 10 years ago. So um, uh, uh, there are a lot of different things that we can talk about, and uh, I hope there will be a chance to present to you the things that we've been working on. Um, I think that's a good place. What, what are unsmart networks? What are unsmart <coughs> networks? Yeah. You see. We'll say we are smart, but what is, when is it that? Uh, I, I don't know that I can uh, answer it very directly. I think no, that, I, I think that uh, we're, we're trying to, I don't know whether we're on a we're time frame that we can uh, do the presentation uh, now. Um, uh, one of the key things that we learn about complex systems is that they have to be organized in relation to the problems that we're faced and facing in the world. Um, and uh, the traditional organizational structures that we have are hierarchical <laughs> organizations. Uh, hierarchical organizations are very powerful ways of making collective behaviors, people to work together. It turns out that they're limited. Technically, one can prove that they're limited to certain degrees of complexity, if you have a certain level of complexity above the ability of an individual to understand or coordinate, um, then we need distributed networks of people that can act um, not through hierarchical organization. Um, the world is undergoing a transition from uh, uh, mostly hierarchical organizations to primarily distributed networks. 
It doesn't mean that hierarchical organizations aren't important, um, but uh, in the context of a, a network like this of individuals, it's uh, fairly uh, uh, important to recognize that it really is not possible to do everything through hierarchies. Um, uh, what I want to do tomorrow, if we get there, uh, is to explain part of the difference between what networks are good for and what hierarchical organizations are good for, um, and to use that as a framework for talking about uh, the problem of emergency responses that we're facing today. Uh, for example, the Ebola epidemic, but there are all kinds of emergencies around the world, um, and we have to address them using a combination uh, of both networks and, and hierarchical organizations. So How would you explain this? This is just a material that's it's actually, from our perspective, it's a simple system, geometrically simple. It's a simple one, um, isn't it? Yeah. That's it. Why is it simple? Because, <laughs> because it can be described by a simple algorithm. Uh -huh. It doesn't have... What so, is an algorithm? Yes. It's yeah, a recipe? Uh, it's, uh, it, I'm sorry. So, this requires some more careful explanation. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions about what I've said that's so far? It, that's it. Yeah, that's a better way to put yeah. it. Well, can you give us an example of a non-complex system? So, yeah, the two, the two, yes, uh, uh, what are simple systems? And the answer is simple systems are either systems that all the parts are independent so we can apply statistics to them. So for those of you who are technically oriented, remember the central limit theorem, which tells us that when you take independent parts and you aggregate them together, you end up with a, 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 a normal distribution. So if you can describe things as independent, you get a normal distribution. And that's simple. It satisfies the assumptions of statistics. The other possibility is that everything is dependent. So everything is moving together in the same direction. Or the same, you know, in the same trajectory, um, and that we could deal with using mechanics. We describe it using equations of motion. So those two different extremes, if you will, are simple systems as far as our analysis is concerned. Um, uh, but the um, uh, as soon as you have various degrees of so, what I'm going to talk about has to do with the fact that the world is connected. Uh, things are dependent on each other, and we see that in crises, right? The financial crisis, pandemic, like Ebola, global terrorism. Um, uh, this slide, uh, so this is about the financial crisis. We're missing pieces of it. I don't know why. This is Tahrir Square, which you may remember during the Arab Spring. Uh, this is the uh, recent uh, Ebola and current still going on Ebola problems. Um, I use this slide for um, for audience. Do you recognize this? This is from the Matrix. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, the, this is about the world as data, if you think about it. These are number streams that are flowing down that are representing uh, things that are happening in the world. Um, and what I wanted to do is to point out that in traditional statistics, if you were to study this, you would take two of these number streams and you would correlate them with each other. And if you were taking, you wanted to do something else, you would take two other number streams and correlate them with each other. Um, but in complex systems, we can take the entire set of data and study patterns. In the data. That really enables us to do different kinds of things, answer different kinds of questions. Um, now, us, me at my institute, we've done many different domains of inquiry, lots of different things, education, cell biology, development, economic development, ethnic violence. Um, and it's surprising that we would be able to do all these different things, but the reason is because we really have these different tools. Um, Multi-scale representations, I'll talk about networks a bit and patterns. Um, so here's a little bit about multi-scale stuff. Um, this is a photograph of a mountains in a valley. Um, if you look closely, you see that the image is made out of pixels, right? Little uh, uh, square regions that have color in them. Um, now we know that we can, if we reduce the resolution, if we eliminate detail, we can use less memory on the computer to show this. 
So I'm just showing you this here. We, this is higher resolution, lower resolution, lower resolution, lower resolution. You see that? Eventually, we get to this. Now this is, in some sense, still the mountain and the valley. We <coughs> lost the details that we care about. Um, so what we have to do is to understand this, and there's a tool that we use for doing this. It's called the complexity profile. Um, it's the amount of information as a function of the resolution. So as we reduce the detail, we end up with less and less information. And, and that's what this picture shows. Um, so this is all the details, and this is kind of the biggest stuff that's going on, which is typically the motion of the system. And, and from a policy perspective, and this is what I'm going to focus on today, um, what we really want to do is understand the biggest stuff. So what's going to affect the whole system? Um, uh, and that's kind of the thing that policy, first of all, has to understand. Um, and so this is what I was a little bit talking about before. If we have completely independent things, we can do statistics. If we have completely dependent things, then we can do um, dynamics in a simple way. Uh, if we have this flock of birds, well, they're not moving all together. It's not a, not, not a good description. And we don't want to talk about what each of the birds is doing. We have to describe the collective behavior of the system, the patterns that are going on. And that's really where complex systems uh, is needed and, and the tools are effective. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about extreme events. Because in recent years, we've been spending a lot of time dealing with crises, uh, using the science. And the world has been dealing with crises a lot. Um, so, how do extreme events happen? Um, and this goes back to the normal distribution. Um, and I want to compare this normal distribution with a fat tail distribution. And the key idea is, if we look over here at events that are sort of big events, extreme events, um, they're much more likely in this fat tail distribution than in the normal <coughs> distribution or thin tail distribution. So the key idea is that if you look at normal distribution, if you look at 100 events, you've basically seen them all. But if you look at, an ex at a fat tail distribution, you could be surprised the next step because an extreme event will happen. Um, so if this is kind of a normal event, the way normal events happen is their combination. So I'm sure this, that's a kind of extreme event which wouldn't happen in the normal. Uh, uh, distribution. So a normal event will happen because we'll take little pieces and we'll add them together, but the little pieces are happening randomly, so they're independent, and that gives you normal distribution. There might be another couple here, yeah, they're just sort of going in any direction. Whereas with the extreme event, the way they happen is by things working together. You might have a few that are going in the other direction, but if they add up to create the big <coughs> event, that's because they're dependent on each other. So dependencies and extreme events go hand in hand. Is that clear? All right, good. So let's talk about what people do together, because when people do things together, if they do things all at once, then you end up extreme events in social systems. Uh, let's talk about uh, Terrier Square for a moment. Why did this happen? So most sources, if you ask this question, they will say, well, there were these dictators. Okay? Um, but they were around for a long time. So it's really kind of hard to attribute the events to that. Here's a better answer. This is a uh, plot, this black line, is a food price index put out by the UN, the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization that puts this out. Um, these Red dashed lines are the dates of food riots, and these are the dates of the Arab Spring. See that? The blue dashed line over here is the date we submitted a report to the U.S. government saying high food prices, social unrest, political instability. That was four days before Mohammed Bouzezi started things in Tunisia. Okay, so we get some credit for anticipation. Now, to say that food prices are connected to riots shouldn't be surprising. I don't think that this work is innovative in doing that. 
But there are a couple of things that this study shows that are really important. First of all, these are global food prices. And these are local riots and revolutions around the world. That's really important. That wouldn't have been true 50 years ago. Maybe even 30 years. The other thing is that this seems to indicate that at about 210 on this index, there is a kind of threshold where a lot of places, a lot of countries begin to have riots and revolutions. That's important. All right. Now, this is the global food supply system, if you will. This is the food exporters and importers, exporters in blue and importers in red, of wheat. I could show you for corn and for rice. We could look at this in more detail. Uh, and we have done some of that, uh, but not enough yet. Um, but the point is that this is a global system of food supply. Okay. Uh, what did we lose here? Oh, yes. Um, so what I want to do, so... I want to look, if you look up here, that's supposed to be a video of this food prices. Do you see this food prices here? This small image shows the food price from 1990. Um, and what you see is that the food prices are going up and down, and then in recent years they shoot up. You see that? So this really requires an explanation. This is not the expected behavior of food prices. Why did this happen? So, there are lots of explanations that have been given in the literature. I'm going to take four of them, and they're not the reasons. Okay? I'll just tell you what they are. One is in changing meat consumption in China. Right? China developed. There are more meat eaters there. Um, uh, could that be important? The answer is no. It's not big enough, actually. Um, there were droughts in <coughs> Australia. Not important enough. <coughs> Um, there is uh, exchange rates, uh, and that turns out in this oil prices leading to food prices increase. That also is not important. The only thing that turns out to be important is one, taking corn in the United States and sticking it into gasoline engines, into cars. 45% of U.S. corn is being put into gasoline. That's enough to feed, it's a food value that would feed two-thirds of a billion people. That's important. The other problem is speculation on commodity markets. This is financial speculation that creates uh, bubbles and crashes. So we put these together into a quantitative model of prices. And this is what we get. So the blue line is the data now. The red dash dotted line is the mathematical model. How did we do? Remarkably well. Now, what this shows, it tells us how things are constructed. The dashed line here is the effect of corn to ethanol conversion. <coughs> okay, so we know that the corn to ethanol conversion is responsible for a doubling. It starts here at about 100 and goes up to about 200 here. It's responsible for a doubling of food prices. Now, in case you're not aware of it, this is a U.S. government mandate. The U.S. government passed a law about how much ethanol should be made and it's being taken from corn. And so this is a mandate by the U.S. government to create biofuels which are causing a doubling of food prices. Quite remarkable. The other thing is the speculation. Here is a point. All the economists in the room, sorry, what you've learned in economics is equilibrium economics. It doesn't do dynamics. Um, and therefore, there's no paper in the economics literature that studies quantitatively the dynamics of bubbles and crashes. But we did do it, because we are not limited by the assumptions of economics. And we are able to reproduce these bubbles. Now, these bubbles are out of equilibrium, that's the question. Yes, how much of the effect is the speculation and how much is the ethanol? So this dashed line would be the result without the speculation. That's the ethanol. But with the ethanol? But with the ethanol. ethanol, without the speculation. And the difference between this and this, the red line, is the effect of the speculation. So when you ask how much, it's not a fixed percentage over time because it's dynamic. So here, the speculation is causing a doubling of food prices. By this date, which is now, 
the ethanol by itself is causing a double in the food prices. Is the size of the ethanol how much the ethanol affects the market is similar to say China and the China is an order of magnitude smaller. Okay, so that's not enough to do. That's the, the point. So if you look at the amount of the impact of, of ethanol on grain, it's ten times the impact of the changing uh, consumption in China. So in a standard economic papers, they'll just do a correlation. But if you look at it quantitatively, it's just tiny. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the warning of uh, instability that you gave four days before his rise started. So that not have been uh, issued a, a little bit earlier. Yeah, well we knew about it earlier. The report was written earlier, but that's when we actually submitted it to the government. And the point here is that once we knew what the reasons were, once we did this analysis, the more important thing is not to just give the warning, but to prevent it. That's what I would much rather do. And in order to prevent it, we see what policies are in place that are causing the problem and can be reversed in order to solve the problem. So reversing the ethanol mandate, which is still being debated in Congress, there are bills in front of the U.S. Congress that would repeal this, um, and uh, reducing the speculation uh, would be the things to do. Okay, Because then it's not just about warning. Warning is not as good as stopping, right? Preventing. Hmm. So um, let me just say something about this. So here, I have a, where did the slide go? It's somewhere else. Okay. This is a bubble. So this is prices that are out of equilibrium. So you know that if prices are out of equilibrium, supply and demand are not equal. So people are producing grain, but it is not being bought. So it's accumulating someplace. It turns out that these are futures markets, so it's accumulating <coughs> later. You buy it now, but you get delivery six to 12 months later. So they accumulated an inventory, but six to 12 months later, if you look at the inventories, they showed up, okay? So the point is that the grains exist and people are unable to buy them. Remember the riots and revolutions? The riots and revolutions were because people went to the shop and couldn't buy food. But the prices were high, not because there was no food, but because of the speculation, the financial speculation. So that's what mostly what I wanted to say about Carrier Square. Um, there's a long list, and it didn't show up here because the slides have been converted. But um, there's something that in the US they call the new normal of riots and revolutions around the world. And there's a long list of them. Um, and what happened is that the food prices went up and down and up and down, and then they, they kind of stabilized at about the level of the threshold that we identified. And as a result, it's sort of not true that there are sort of revolutions all over all at once, but every now and then, any place where there's some irritation, a riot or revolution breaks out. Yes? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt that, but um, uh, on, could, could the, uh, the current crude oil slump also be attributed to the uh, corn, the general corn version? Give me just one second, I'll get to that. Yes, uh, go ahead. You had another question? Just wondering whether, um, I mean, so it appears that the social economic environment where the crisis manifests as a riot is irrelevant. It's, it's not entirely irrelevant. The economic conditions of these countries and places where it didn't happen. That's, so that's the point is that it's not that we did an analysis of each country's conditions. That's not the message of this analysis. Yes. At this level, we're just saying that there are widespread conditions around the world yeah. that are consistent with riots and revolutions above this threshold. If I may, the reason I ask is the question is how is it that some countries were able to in a sense, contain the riot, sure. and others were not. So that's a really important yes. question. But yes. the answer is in the question, right? Yes. And if, yes. if, if government and policies responded to protect the population from desperation, but why do people riot? Because, because they're desperate. They can't feed their families. This that's where I suppose real. a self-learning comes So you have to know how to prevent it from happening when it's crisis. Yes. Yes. What causes the speculation and by who? Great. 
So the speculation, I think I have a slide to answer that. Do you have a question relevant to that? Or? Yeah, it's, it kind of ties into that. It's, it, um, I understand the tie-in with ethanol, but you said that there was tons of grain available. Yes. That it just wasn't being given. So ethanol production didn't eliminate the grains that were needed. No, remember there are two different effects. Mm. There is the Actually, taking of the corn for ethanol, and then there's the but storage. then there's an addition over production beyond that supply and demand level. But that, but what that's I'm saying uh, is that there was enough grain to go around. It correct. just wasn't being distributed. Correct. So it's not necessarily so, ethanol that doing it. But well, it depends when. Depends when and at what point in time, right? Because if we go back here, you see, in 2007 and 8, in 2007 and 8. Look at this. In 2007-8, the impact of the ethanol was small compared to the impact of the speculation. But by the time we get to now, the impact of the ethanol is much larger. Okay, so it depends at what point in time you're talking about. Yeah. Um, let, let me try to answer the other question over here. So the question was about the yeah, speculation. Yeah, kind of around quarter two. We'll yeah, right. do something. Okay. Um, so. First of all, let me get to the energy issues. This is a plot of energy or oil prices. And we can do the same kind of modeling and show that the, there were peaks that are due to speculation. We have not continued it until now, but it is possible indeed that this current uh, process is also speculative. It's not only positive, it can also be negative directions, and it's uh, uh, unstable. The market is unstable. Um, the question about where this came from is here. This is the mortgage market crash. This is housing prices. This is the stock market crash. This is a peak you see of all commodities. What happened is that people needed some place to put money, so they moved it into the commodity markets. So this is not a supply and demand, it's a money moving <coughs> issue. And as prices went up, right, it, it, right that's the uh, trend following, right? Price go up because people buy more, driving the price up even more. And that's how this bubble was created. Does that answer the question? Was asked yeah. about this. Okay. So let me talk. Let me go on and talk about a couple of other things. Um, this is analysis of the stock market dynamics. Um, what we did here is we looked at panic on the stock market. So panic is when everyone is doing the same thing, right? If you get out of the market, I better get out of the market. So this is actually a measure of the degree to which people are doing the same thing. It's co-movement. Um, the, the more co-movement is actually down, and up is calm behavior, if you will. Um, and what we did is we looked at the difference from one year to the previous year of this measure. And, and this is the measure of difference. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to mark the places where it went down by more than two standard deviations. So here the statistical measure is reasonable to use. And um, I marked the one-year periods after it went down, after having been up above zero. Here are all the lar uh, largest one-day crashes in the stock market. So what this says is that when you have a one-day crash, before that, people are panicking. That's not too surprising. People are panicking, and then you have a panic. But the point is that we can actually have a measure of panickiness and figure out when these crashes are going to take place. All right. Let me show you a couple of fun things that we can do. This is using Twitter. You're familiar with Twitter, yes? So Twitter, a, a couple of percent of tweets are geotagged. So we know where the person was when they did the tweet. What we did here is we did a, a sentiment analysis. So we, we asked how do people feel when they're tweeting. Um, we didn't ask them, we just figured it out from the tweet. Uh, I don't know if you recognize this is Manhattan, right? And New York City. And if you look at this, if you know, this is Central Park. And uh, the, the uh, magenta, sorry, the cyan is positive and the magenta is negative. So what we see is that people are happy in parks. <laughs> which I'm sure surprises you a lot. <laughs> um, they're unhappy in traffic jams going into tunnels and bridges. 
Um, this is a sewage dump, which is a, stinks a lot. I have not been there, but I have it on good report. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't actually sought it out. So, so you can actually see how people feel using this uh, kind of analysis. Um, this is a, uh, it's not going to show. I have a movie that I could show you some other time of how people, you know, wake up and go to work and go home and go to sleep, and you can see all the dynamics of Twitter behavior. Uh, and I have another one showing it globally, which again is not showing up. Um, this is another analysis where we see how people organize themselves in society. Um, so what we did is we took people who tweet links to New York Times articles, um, and um, uh, and we uh, put this network together by uh, pulling together the people who are, are um, talking to each other, are connected, followers, and pushing apart the people who are not. And then we colorize this by the subjects that they were tweeting. Um, and what we found out is that there are people who care about global things, and they talk to people who care about global things. There are people who care about New York, and they talk to people who care about New York. There are people who care about national things, and they are polarized into liberal and conservative, and people who care about business, sports, and arts. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this enables us to understand how society is organized, how it chooses, who chooses to talk to whom, uh, which is really interesting, right? Um, the last thing that I wanted to do, and this is just not going to work, actually, so I think we're going to have to do it later, um, is I have, um, uh, 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 we did an analysis of Ebola. Um, let me see if I can, I'll just try to show it with this. This is, um, uh, there's a video uh, that I should be able to show you, but it's not, these things are not coming out right now. Um, so let me try to explain what we did. So this is work we did about 10 years ago, starting more than 10 years ago. What we were interested in is the evolution of pathogens. Um, so when pathogens mutate, um, you know, uh, viruses or, or bacteria, when they mutate, they can become more aggressive, spreading more rapidly or being more fatal. Or they can mutate to be less. Um, it turns out that in a spatial environment like this, this is a host is green and, and the colored ones are the pathogens. Um, the ones that are the most aggressive ones don't thrive, they die out. Now, I'm not sure why it's clear, um, so because I can't show you the video, but can anyone figure out why they would die out? They're dumb. No, because the host dies. Because yeah. the host dies. They are dumb. They kill their host. They kill their host, exactly yeah. right. They kill their host, and they die out as also, right? So here, if you look at it, there's a really aggressive variety. This is snapshots taken every 50 generation. So there is a bright blue one. You see that one? And it's rapidly spreading, and it kills. It makes this hole in the space, right? And it dies out. And the ones that are less aggressive are the ones that you see later on. So that's really important to know. What happens if we add long-range transportation, i.e. airplane loops? So what happens is that we start with an image like this, uh, where you have the uh, ones that are uh, less aggressive, let's say. And then as you add long-range transportation, you end up with more aggressive ones. Why? Because they escape the local extinction and get somewhere else. And as you add more long range, you get even more aggressive ones. And then you get an even more aggressive ones, but then the entire thing goes extinct. Is that clear? So we have this, what we call a phase transition to extinction. Right? Phase transition is like water boiling or something. We have, at, for low connectivity in the system, we have a unit probability of survival. For high connectivity, we have a zero probability of survival. And there's this sharp transition between them. So as we add more and more transportation, we might go through this transition without even knowing that it happened. Uh -huh. Now, I, I spoke about this this January at the World Health Organization. They were a little bit surprised, so it almost <coughs> a year ago. 
Um, now, in addition to showing them this, I showed them a simulation. And again, all my simulations are not working today because of the AV. I showed them a simulation which starts with a point infection where Ebola used to be. Now, I didn't do this because of the Ebola epidemic this year. I did this because Ebola is a terrible disease that was present in remote areas and was not spreading. And if you think about it for a minute, you'll realize that it's clear that once you have more transportation, it's going to escape. And we did. And in 2006, we wrote in a paper about this subject, watch out for Ebola. Because as transportation increases, we're going to end up with a global pandemic. So uh, this is, of course, what happened. Um, and I have to say that you would think that other people would be aware of this. But in general, people are always thinking about the experience that they already had and not thinking about what is going to happen as a result of changes or as a result of unlikely events that are eventually going to happen. So this is a real key issue, yeah. Isn't that because of networks? Networks in healthcare often <coughs> become specialized. But if you ask a transportation network, they'd tell you this is exactly what would happen. Right. But this is a health problem, isn't it? We'll assign the doctors to be in charge of the response. But that's due to network mobilization. <laughs> right. So, so so this is the way doctors treat patients, right? When the patient shows up in the doctor's office, we will figure out what's wrong and treat them. Is that the way to deal with an epidemic? No. no. I think we will. Yeah, we're almost done. I'm minutes. almost done. So, um, so we really need to understand this, and this is uh, Freetown in Sierra Leone, and this is the explosion that's continuing to happen. It hasn't uh, yet stopped there. Um, what I want to do yet tomorrow more is I'll talk about the breakdown of this and what responses are really needed. Um, and the real key thing, what, one of the key things is you need response that is not focused just on the individual. There has to be a community level response, there has to be a you know, urban level response, there has to be a national response, there has to be a global response. The physicians are not trained to do that. Um, so we have to worry about that. Just as a story, um, I explained this, and I wrote a paper saying that we had to do neighborhood level response. And we talked about sending in teams into neighborhoods and doing it. Then I called up people in Liberia, and they told me that, in fact, they just started doing this two weeks previously. And this is the infection rate in Liberia as it went up, and then as they started to implement the community level response, it went down. I can tell you that the physicians, a month after, a month and a half, even two months after this were happening, we're saying, uh, we don't understand why people are sick or not showing up at the hospital. They were sitting in the hospital waiting for the patients to show up, whereas the reason that it was being stopped is because people in neighborhoods were going around door to door and screening people for fever. So, um, so this was a quick, this was really quick, by the way, discussion of you know the riots and revolutions, the panic on markets, the issues that we saw on Twitter, which I just threw in there for the fun of it so we could see other things. Uh, there's Ebola, we could talk about terrorism, we could talk about other things. But the point is, uh, we really have this global risk. There's a vulnerability globally because we're connected. Everybody's connected, wherever you are. And so we have to understand the nature of how these risks are propagating. And, and to understand that policy decisions, I mean, the ones that I talked about were the ones that were made in the United States. But today, policy decisions anywhere are affecting everywhere. Thank you.